Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Bybee, and I direct the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics and Media here in Syracuse. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the eighth and final lecture in our Law, Politics, and Media speaker series this semester. This speaker series is sponsored by IJPM and by the uh, Tully Center for Free Speech, directed by um, Floyd Gutterman. Now, I, I know you've probably heard uh, the saying that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And I got to say, looking at, Roy, looking at Roy, I've just discovered another planet in the solar system, a planet burning love. It's the only explanation Roy could be from. So God, always glad to have Roy's help. Roy has been a key part of sponsoring this series this semester and for all the previous iterations uh, of this course. He's also a co-director of IJPM. And uh, we look forward to partnering on the speaker series and the Law, Politics, and Media course uh, again next year. Hope to see um, uh, people turn out for that. Our speaker today is Matt Dickinson. He is a political scientist at uh, Middlebury College, uh, and he specializes on the presidency. He's uh, had his articles published widely in academic journals. He's author of the book uh, Bitter Harvest, uh, which is about uh, FDR presidential power and the growth of the presidential branch. He's also at work. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about, I guess, how he's not at work <laughs> on his latest project on presidential staffing. He's also known as a political blogger. Uh, he uh, began this blog in 2008 and has uh, been, uh, been blogging ever since. It's called Presidential Power. Every four years, this blog catches fire and is distributed on a variety of platforms. I think he's it's a, he just caught fire three times. Right, right, exactly, three, three times. Well, it, that, it was sort of, there was some sparks and a little bit of smoke uh, the <laughs> first time. smoke. But it's Christian Science Monitor, uh, US News. US News. Uh, you can also hear from Matt, uh, quoted by a number of political reporters who follow the campaign. And when he first agreed to talk uh, in this series, we gave his lecture the title, Blogging in the Age of Obama. Now, I've known Matt for a very long time. Uh, we were both faculty together at, at Harvard. We were members of the same book club which featured no books, but the bar was next to the bookstore. So <laughs> felt like we could call it a book club. And I knew that Matt would change the title. I knew he would, he would uh, move away from this uh, anodyne blogging in the age of Obama title and produce something that was uh, more pungent. And that's what we have today. How I squandered my leave year to follow Donald Trump and 20 other presidential candidates across the country. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Matt Dickinson. Thank you, Keith, for that eloquent introduction, reminding me of those evenings reading those great books. They went down smooth. Uh, and thank you, Roy, for putting up with him, because uh, <laughs> I had eight years of it. Uh, he was my hallmate, and boy, I know what you're going through. And thank all of you for showing up here, and apparently they saved the best speaker for last in this series. Um, it's good to be back to Syracuse. Keith was nice enough to invite me out of on a sort of a Home and Away series. I bring him out to uh, Middlebury. He comes out here. Oh, sorry, I come out here. So I guess it's my turn. Um, and as Keith noted, I originally thought I would talk about my blog. My blog actually started um, about the same time I gave my first talk here back in 2008. It grew out of a series of emails I was sending my students during the 2008 campaign, basically reacting to media coverage, which was abysmal. Presidential elections has gotten better since a lot of the data-driven journalism has uh, taken hold. And the emails gradually were forwarded from students to parents, and parents started contacting the college, saying, where can I get more of this? And the college asked me to start the Presidential Power blog, which I have been doing intermittently now since 2008. And you know, it's caught on. It's, it's, uh, it's not the New York Times, but it's gotten a good following. And I periodically try to give it up, and people email me and say, have you died? Uh, and so I continue it. Um, and I was looking forward to this leave year because I was going to put the blog behind me and write that long-awaited sequel to my original book on the origins of the White House staff, presidential, uh, what was it called again? Bitter Harvest. Bitter Harvest. Got the title my book. And I've done tons of research and was all ready to write the, um, really the ultimate study of the organization of the White House. And uh, I happened to watch Donald Trump come down the steps in June. Uh, on the escalator to Trump Tower, 
and announced that he was running for president. And he was he had a series of policy proposals, very serious ones, like preventing Mexican rapists. They're not all rapists, but some of them are, from coming into the country illegally. He was going to build a huge wall uh, and so on. And um, I just thought this was the greatest thing. Uh, and so I wrote this blog, very, it was a satire. This is one of the best blogs I ever wrote. And essentially it was playing off uh, something that my students are very familiar with, which is the fact that I don't vote. I don't vote in any elections except the one my wife is running in. Uh, and even then I don't necessarily tell her who I'm voting for, that she's a local politician. Um, but I, without taking you through this entire blog, I just basically listed all his policy positions and say these are brilliant and I have no doubt that he is going to build a wall and he's going to restore our trade um, and yada, yada, yada. And I finish with, uh, you know, the catch line. Um, I'm here to tell you I'm breaking my pledge this election cycle. I'm voting for the Donald. And I think if you watch his announcement, which I had linked to, you'll vote for him too. So join me and Gary Boosie. You see, and Terrell Owens, these are both people who endorse Trump, if you know who they are. Uh, Gary Busey, best known for not wearing a motorcycle helmet and then getting in a motorcycle accident mm -hmm. and severely concussed. And Terrell Owens, he's a football player. Uh, and thousands of other would-be apprentices who watched the Donald speech and came away thinking, Donald, you're hired. So really funny because I was playing off the celebrity apprentice then because as I told the local news station, it was quite clear Donald Trump's candidacy was going to last all of three weeks. Uh, unfortunately, I was quoted on saying that, and I blogged about that. Well, now it's been 30 weeks, and uh, clearly I got something wrong. Uh, as we saw last night with the New York power couple winning. Um, by the way, if you're wondering who's hanging out with who, there's a reason why Bill is between Melania and Hillary, and not the other way around. It's feeling her pain. Um, <laughs> So, he's feeling something there with that arm. Notice the <laughs> tight grip right there. Cut power to your mind. <laughs> um, so, my wife is saying, move on, move on. Oh, you want to see that, okay. The people are speaking. Let's. No, no, you won't take care of it here. It's the room lights. Oh, it's the room lights you want. Yeah. Okay, sorry about this. Oh, you've got to see these. I worked hard for a lot of these. As you can see, I've learned to use my, my smartphone to which take wife pictures. Is that? Which, which uh, wife? Which wife? Uh, that's my first one. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that's the only one I was planning on having, by the way. Oh, that's his third. That's Melania. Current, current wife. wife. Yes, current wife, Melania. Third and current. Third and current, yes. She's actually very accomplished. Um, We'll, we don't want to talk about wives right now. Uh, um, and I, periodically, I like to sprinkle these things in there. American Gothic horror. So this got me thinking, obviously, I was wrong. Or I underestimated Trump. But it's no consolation that practically every other political scientist underestimated him, too, as did most journalists. Um, the question was why. How can I portray myself as an expert blogger, specialist on American presidency, I'm an expert on presidential elections, if I couldn't foresee Trump winning the nomination, which he is poised to do, as you well know. Um, and so rather than write my book, I have squandered my uh, leave, and it's not over yet, uh, basically going to candidate rallies. Uh, as you can see, I've managed to collect a lot of swag. It's one of the good things. I'm very proud of my uh, Jim Gilmore right there. I had a Jim Gilmore brochure. I got that at a rally that Jim Gilmore did not show up to, uh, which explains a lot about his presidential candidacy. It was a Jim Gilmore rally. I went to see him. He never showed up. Um, number one fan. This is my table, my presidential election table. And that's my presidential t-shirt. It wasn't that big when I started out, but after all the paraphernalia got on it. And of course, that's my latest edition. $25 the latest Trump rally on Friday in Plattsburgh, uh, made in China, to make America great cap, made in China. All right, so what have I concluded? Since I predicted Trump's demise, he's won, make that 20 of 39 contests, tied for the lead in three others. He's won uh, about 8.1 million votes. That's about 2 million more than Ted Cruz. Those figures have gone up since yesterday. He leads the delegate race 756 to 559. 
And again, that has gone up as of yesterday. He won, what, 89, 90 delegates, something like that. I've been on the road, so I haven't seen uh, what Wolf's latest um, totals were. All right, so what went wrong? How do we explain Trump? What is this Trump phenomenon? Phenomenon. I set out in search for America, or America's lost greatness, um, to see what I could find, the secret of Trump's success. Um, and my presidential odyssey has taken me from Vermont to New Hampshire. That's not too much of a trip. Uh, but then I went to South Carolina, Florida, back up to New York. Um, I'm hoping to get to Connecticut and Pennsylvania, and I'm working on media credentials to go to the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. Um, since June, I've, have, I've written 86 blog posts. Whoops. <laughs> 86 blog posts, uh, averaging about 1,000 words each. Um, and I didn't write a single word for my late project. Not a single word. Um, so I've really squandered a year's worth of uh, leave. Uh, but it's for a good cause. I've come to places like Syracuse and explained Donald Trump. And a few beers later, this was uh, from one of my hotel refrigerators. Uh, here's what I found. That's what I lived on on the trail, by the way. It's cheap, but it's filling. And it tastes great. It's less filling. All right. So quickly, I, I went through a series of candidates. Here's John Kasich, who has promised to... Uh, be the antidote to darkness. He is bringing light to the campaign. John Kasich, and of course that's why you can't see him, because he's in the light, but that's him in Vermont, where he finished a close second to Donald Trump when they split the delegates. Um, got to see him kissing babies. This baby was just sort of thrust in his hands, and the woman said, you know, give a benediction or something. So there he is. This was down in South Carolina, where I managed to do four rallies in one day. Um, ben Carson. This is South Carolina, one of Ben's youngest supporters. Um, but at this point, he was on fume, so he's basically registering anybody he could to vote for himself. <laughs> right? um, this was Ted Cruz. This was in South Carolina. Fairly big rally, but that was mostly because the Duck Commander. Those of you who watch Duck Dynasty? Yes, Duck Dynasty? Only one here. Uh, you ought to watch it. It makes the Kardashians look uh, normal. Um, the commander of the Duck Dynasty, Phil, was, did the introduction. It was probably the funniest single introduction to a campaign event I've seen all year. Um, Duck Dynasty. I tried to get a hold of Ted. He turned his back to me. There he is interviewing. That was in New Hampshire. Jeb Bush. Jeb, of all the candidates I saw, and you wouldn't believe this based on his debate performance, was the most articulate the most substantively grounded in policy details, and had the greatest rapport with his audience members. I mean, again, we're talking about 100 people here. This was in a high school in New Hampshire. Uh, I saw lots of buses. This particular one is cruising the history. Or, sorry, victory. Uh, I saw Rand Paul, a very bitter Rand Paul. By the time he got to New Hampshire, he was practically out of the race. And, was already being belittled by Donald Trump as being the small guy at the end of the debate stage, really small. Um, Marco Rubio tried to ingratiate himself by his audience by saying how much he respected Tom Brady. He hoped that Tom Brady uh, would retire soon so he could appoint him to his cabinet. That way he wouldn't play against the Dolphins, which was Rubio's team. Um, so there's Rubio in there. Um, I almost got run over by Rubio's bus. You know, we were at a campaign rally. I was pulled into this parking lot. I got this right next to the hotel. And his staff came running out and said, you got to leave. you got to leave. The bus is pulling in. So I turned around, and there it was, smiling Marco Rubio. Carly Fiorina. I almost said Carly Simon for some reason. <laughs> Carly Fiorina. She talked about her very good friend, Bibi. Pretty much that's about all she talked about was her very good friend, Bibi. She had a lot of good friends, um, but Bibi was maybe her best friend. Um, George Pataki. George, it was all about 9-11, uh, being governor of New York when 9-11 happened. You know, I'm not sort of making fun of these things, but what struck me about these candidates was just how accomplished they were. You know, people made fun of the Republican field in particular, but you had an impressive set of people. You didn't realize how impressive they were until you actually went to these rallies and listened to them talk. Um, here he is um, being observed by a moose right behind him. Here's Lindsay. Lindsay very early made it clear she want, he wanted to bomb ISIS. 
Um, and that was pretty much his whole campaign, bombing ISIS. Um, there's Christie. I make fun of Chris, but why not? Uh, this was at a restaurant in Lebanon, New Hampshire. I actually saw several Christie rallies. He's actually very good as well, very good with people, but he only uh, almost showed the Christie temper when one woman questioned him about his views on, Elson, was it abortion? On abortion. And the Christie, he stood up and loomed over her and started jabbing her. And then he suddenly modulated himself and realized, this isn't New Jersey anymore. I'm running for president. I have to look presidential. Um, famous Christie temper. Um, and this is a Jim Gilmore rally. <laughs> Uh, the speaker right here is introducing Jim Gilmore, one of the more awkward moments in the entire campaign. Jim Gilmore! And they all sat around. And he's, does anyone know where Jim Gilmore is? <laughs> I mean, it was a metaphor for Jim Gilmore's campaign. Uh, never showed up. I don't know what happened to him. I never got to see him. But I did get a lot of let literature. And then I went to this rally. Notice the difference in crowds. And then this rally. This is in New Hampshire. Um, the first Trump of many Trump rallies I've been to. I got in the back. It was about 25 degrees out. When we got there, expecting dust to go right in the door, turned out there was a line stretching out for about a mile, 25 degree weather. Um, what we hadn't realized was this was early in Trump's campaign. He had Secret Service protection. So unlike the other candidates, everyone had to get screened going in there. We hadn't anticipated that. They hadn't worked out the bugs yet. But we were pretty sure in 25 degree weather, no one was going to wait around to get into this. There, there was a, a couple ahead of us. The woman had sandals on, 25 degree weather. So we were pretty sure she'd drop by frostbite alone would kill her. Uh, not a single person left. That line stayed. Every person in there, we all got in. By the time we got in, the media was right behind him. I was in the back. Uh, and it was my first inkling that I had completely underestimated this guy, that he had a message that was resonating with people on policy, on substance, very superficial policy substance, that no other Republican candidate was really talking about. I mean, he was distinct. He was unique. Uh, and he was speaking to them in a unique way that you cannot fully appreciate relying on sound bites, particularly sound bites that are presented on cable television, which focus on the most incendiary, controversial statements and sort of siphon out what's really substantively meaningful to his audience. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But it was an eye opener. I suddenly realized this guy had staying power. He wasn't just a celebrity, although that celebrity aspect him was a very big part of his initial support. Um, and of course, uh, the cross section here, his audiences tend to be a little, they're predominantly white. Of course, I was in New Hampshire, so that went a long way to explain that. But even South Carolina, although he had more African Americans down there, it was still predominantly white, predominantly downscale, as much as you can see downscale from appearances without generalizing and stereotyping. Um, but that's not all it was. I mean, there was a huge cross-section of people, and I'll show you some data on this in just a moment. What struck me about this was he actually took questions. I couldn't believe this. Uh, and there was a man right next to me. He said, we're sitting in the very back, the media just behind us. And he says, any questions? And the guy next to me says, yeah, if you're elected, who are you going to fire? And the uh, crowd roared. I thought that was the funniest thing because, of course, that's what he does in a Celebrity Apprentice. He fires people. But then the guy said it again even when he wasn't asked. And then he repeated it again and again. And every 10 minutes, he'd pop up and say, who are you going to fire? It wore thin in a hurry. All right, so how do we explain Trump? Well, the conventional wisdom, I think that you still hear, particularly on MSNBC and more liberal-oriented stations there, Trump's support are among the poorly educated, the misogynistic, racist, xenophobic authoritarians, right? Of course, some people think those are Republican voters in general, um, but particularly Trump voters. And I, frankly, growing up there in my liberal haven of Vermont and seeing what I know about him basically on snippets of coverage on cable, I thought this was probably not far from the truth. But uh, I have now changed my tune. Um, and it is true that he has 
note the spelling of get a brain morons. <laughs> there was a certain type at some of his rallies. Um, and you remember, he, he often talks in his speeches about how he loves people. He'll go off on riffs. This is the thing about him. He'll be talking policy, and then he has a thought, and it comes out. And some of his riffs are the, when he, he says, you know, people say African Americans won't support me, but I love the African Americans, and they love me too. And then he'll go on a riff, the love group, right? Uh, and at one point he said, I love the poorly educated. Um, this was a Plattsburgh, you know, the t-shirt? If you don't bleed red, white, and blue, take your rhymes with rich ass home. These are being sold at his, he's the only candidate who uh, has vendors all over the place selling. Uh, Sanders has some stuff too, but it's not nearly as exciting as this stuff. Um, you know, you go to a rally and this is what you see all, all out there. Um, what was funny was we were at Plattsburgh and a college student had bought this uh, at SUNY Plattsburgh. And uh, we saw him later frantically running around. He came up to me and said, are you the reporter who interviewed me? And I said, no. And uh, I'm not a reporter. And I said, why? He said, because she took a picture, uh, the reporter took a picture of me wearing this t-shirt and I'm afraid my mother's gonna see it. <laughs> I hope we found him. All right, bikers love the Donald. This was in a South Carolina rally. There's a the Knights and Templars. Uh, so it turns out if you don't look very deeply beneath the headlines, you can find all sorts of evidence that Trump supporters are racist. So a YouGov poll shows 20% of Mr. Trump's voters disagreed with the freeing of the slaves in the southern states after the Civil War. By comparison, only 5% of Marco Rubio's voters showed this. So that seems a little bit racist, doesn't it? 20% of his supporters think, eh, slavery was OK. Right? This is the type of thing that gets bandied about. And you can even do some pseudo statistical stuff. Here is the percent of blacks in counties and the percentage of whites voting for Trump. And you can see there's a strong correlation. The more blacks there are in county, the stronger white support for Trump. Again, you don't have to read too far between the lines to suggest that's kind of racist. Um, if you measure, as political scientists do, I mean, I, I often go, when I give this speech, I often ask, uh, you know, people say, are Trump supporters racist? And I say, I don't know, let's ask. You know, how many are Trump supporters? And the hands go up, and then I say, how many are racist? Raise your hand if you're racist. So let me, let me try this. How many, raise your hand if you're a racist. Raise your hand. Now, what's interesting, I have been doing this for eight years, giving these talks. One person in that time has raised their hand that said she was a racist, and I didn't follow up on exactly how she was a racist. So you get the point here. You have to infer racism based on questions. Political scientists have drawn up some questions. These are the ones we, we use. Um, and again, it's pretty straightforward. And from this, we construct an index. And that's a racial resentment index. And it turns out um, Trump supporters rank pretty high on the racial resentment index here. right? So um, here's your probability that you would prefer Trump, and here's where you are on the racial resentment scale. Contrast to Marco Rubio, where the relationship runs different. Right? This is from 2016 American National Election Pilot Study. Well, I'm not going to run you through all this, but it turns out when you begin, as I did, start looking more closely at this evidence, the, it, it becomes less obvious to me that his support is driven primarily by racism or misogyny or xenophobia. I am not denying that among Trump supporters, these are some of the motivations that supporting him. But it really does a disservice to a lot of Trump supporters to sort of get lumped in uh, in these categories. And one of the things that's difficult, of course, is trying to tap into racism. It turns out those questions that we, I showed you on racial resentment, um, so Irish, Italians, Jewish, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favors. Um, that's kind of pretty close to should federal spending on programs that assist blacks be increased, decreased, or kept about the same. Or some people feel the government in Washington should make every effort to improve the social and economic position for blacks. Others feel the government should not make any special effort to help blacks. Now, these questions, it turns out, aren't designed to test racism. They are designed 
by political scientists to test your support for race-based policies, such as affirmative action and so on. And it turns out, without running you through the statistical mumbo jumbo, these seem to be tapping into ideology that's not strongly correlated with racial resentment. Um, there's a separate dimension here. Um, so it's not entirely clear if that that racial resentment question is really tapping into racial resentment or tapping into some people's views on whether the government should actively promote equality of opportunity um, or equality of result based on race. There's a real difference uh, in motivations here. And it turns out that slavery question, I was really suspicious of that. Um, and whenever you're suspicious of something, you should actually go back and look at the original survey. Turns out that YouGov survey preceded the question by asking whether you approved of Barack Obama's use of executive orders as a way to bypass Congress. In fact, there was a couple of them asking about the use of executive orders as a way of making policy. And then it went to the Emancipation Proclamation, which actually said, not that you approve of slavery or not, or freeing the slaves, but do you approve or disapprove of the executive order? which freed all slaves in the states that were in rebellion against the federal government. And it turns out that 13, 20%, uh, it actually you break it down, 53% of Trump supporters strongly approved, 17 approved somewhat, 8% disapproved somewhat, and only 5% disapproved strongly. And you can see you prime them to respond to executive order. So a lot of them are looking at this and saying, executive orders, what do I think about executive orders? I know Trump has gone crazy on the campaign trail about criticizing Obama's use of executive orders. I support Trump on this. So you don't know how much of this question is really tapping into the executive order, which the question order has primed you, because this question came right after two previous ones talking about Obama's use of executive orders. You know who else has strong support? Strong support. 13% of their supporters disapprove of this executive order. Bernie Sanders supporters. Are they racists? Well, maybe they are. I don't know. But the point is, there's a lot of ways you can interpret this data uh, when you start digging into it. And remember that percent higher proportion of blacks, greater tendency for whites to vote for Trump? You've got to worry about the ecological fallacy. If you go back down to 2008, it turns out the higher percentage of blacks, the greater percentage of whites voted for Obama. Probably not racists, right? So there may be something else going on here. It may be an economic issue, right? Uh, you may just be in districts that are lower economics. And in 2008, a lot of them voting Obama. In uh, 2016, we know a lot of downscale whites are voting Trump, right? So I'm not dismissing the role of race or racism. It may be there, but you have to be very careful about jumping to that as the blanket explanation. I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't gone to the rallies. Here's a rally in South Carolina. Um, and again, this is stretching out. Went all the way over to there, up to there, and somewhere down in the corner of the room. Um, and again, they're hawking the things here. Um, and of course, these are some Trump paraphernalia. It's got Trump on it. You can make money. And these things are just raucous events. They're, you go there, there's folk singers who have written songs about Trump, the ballad of Donald Trump, and they're singing them. And um, of course, not everybody likes them. This was a Trump dump. <laughs> so you usually get your fair share of protesters, both inside and outside. Um, for the most part, the protesters are nonviolent, although you wouldn't know that watching the Rachel Maddow show. Um, and then, of course, you go inside. That's Here's my famous smartphone photographs. See the crystal, crystal clear detail? <laughs> That's, why he's in the room with us. That's Donald. But this is, Allison and I, we tend to stay in the back in case there's a riot. We want to be able to get out the exit. So we're usually in the back with the media, uh, who are never allowed on the floor at Trump rallies, by the way, because they don't pass through security. And he mocks them openly during his speeches. They're sitting in the back, and he just sort of makes fun of them. Um, it's really hilarious. But you can see every, everyone's got their cameras up here. Why? Because a protest had just broken out here. Uh, and whenever there's a protester, Trump has a standard line, which he's, he says to the media, oh, this is great. Because every time I get home to my speech, I ask Melania, I say, Melania, did you see the huge crowd I had? And she says, no, Donald. All they do is focus on you. And he says, 
now when there's a protest, I tell the cameras to show the protesters so they can see how big my crowd is. Right? He says this during every demonstration. And my picture taking skill, skills getting better. This one was in Plattsburgh, I believe. This one was in South Carolina. Plattsburgh, this recent one. Again, you can see the t-shirts. Um, you know, every once in a while, he'll see somebody in the crowd. He has wonderful crowd. He loves these people and they love him. But he'll be talking and someone will be out there and he'll just stop and he'll invite them up on stage. Take a picture with me. Or in this particular case, he said, I see a handsome, strong man out there. That's a strong, handsome man. That's like a Trump supporter. Okay, fine. So I think he was an inebriated college student. That's what I thought. But no, he was a handsome, strong man. Um, he always talks about how his crowds are beautiful. And afterwards, he wades in. There he is. I've learned now at his rallies when he's done, I just push everybody out of the way and just funnel my way as close as I can to take a picture with my great picture taking skills with my smartphone, which you can't use if you're not smart. I realized that after I bought it. Um, uh, so here he is, he comes in, he signs everything in his crowd and the secret service are around him. They were afraid someone's gonna try to muss up his hair. So they were really very careful, but uh, he has a grand time and the crowd's just gravitate towards him. They love him. Uh, this is a little side story. I, I, how are we doing on time? When, when should I stop here? About quarter of five? Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Well, it's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> so we, in South Carolina, we went to, we went to, we were going to see a Ted Cruz rally. So we went to the Cruz rally. We come back to our hotel in Myrtle Beach. And uh, we try to go to our room, and we're stopped by Secret Service. And law enforcement's all over the place. And we say, uh, they say, what are you doing here? We say, well, this is our room. They said, we have to wait. You can't go back up right now. So we start asking questions the night before Donald Trump decided to stay in the same hotel we were in. And we hadn't been cleared for security, so they wouldn't let us back in. Uh, and so we waited out there for half an hour uh, for the Donald to make his appearance. And finally, we just gave up, and we went to the Donald Trump's rally. Uh, where we knew eventually he'd show up. Um, all right, so what explains, that's my little picture show of Donald Trump. What it, have I learned? Well, I think a good chunk of Trump's support is in his issue configuration. He has latched onto issues that are being ignored by both parties, but particularly the Republican Party. Um, and the best I can describe it is as a combination of economic populism. So when he talks about his policy positions, you look at the crowd to see how they're responding. Now, he talks in stream of consciousness, level of superficiality that, you know, at first you just find irritating. But it all holds together. It coheres in a way that you look at people and they're nodding their heads. Uh, and they're saying, yes, finally somebody gets it. He's talking about the issues that are important to us. So he's not a typical Republican. Um, you know, immigration for him is as much a national security issue as it is an economic issue. Um, and that sort of is explained by his uh, Muslim comment. What was interesting in Florida, if you looked at the exit polls in Florida, uh, a majority of people in Florida supported a pathway for legal status for illegal immigrants. It's like 58%. They voted for Donald Trump. That same, uh, not necessarily the same, but another plurality, a majority, also supported a temporary ban on Muslims from entering the United States. And how do you fix, how do you reconcile those? They also, by the way, voted for Donald Trump. The way you reconcile that is for a lot of people, particularly in the aftermath of terror strikes, immigration is a national security issue, more than an economic issue. In Florida, they love illegal immigrants because they're doing a lot of the wage jobs that they need. Um, trade, his trade thing, when you hear him talk about trade, he says, I'm a free trader, but I'm also a smart trader. The Chinese are cleaning our pot. By the way, I love the Chinese. I've got companies in China. Uh, many of the Chinese are in my buildings, blah, blah, blah. He loves everybody. Um, but we need to be smart in trade. And right now we've got dummies in Washington who are making these trade deals. I mean, it's a Bernie Sanders argument. It's not your typical conservative Republican free trade rises all boats. Um, you know, he's making stagnant wages. He talks a lot about buying power. Um, and this is a reality. Despite the growth in, in employment, you have not seen a growth in disposable income. It's been stagnant, particularly for lower uh, and sort of slightly lower and middle class Americans of a particular type. He's talking to them in these rallies. 
And he doesn't talk down to them. He, when I went to these other rallies, every other candidate talked about, even Jeb Bush talked about their humble beginnings. John Kasich's father was a postman and then he got killed in an auto accident, his parents. And Donald Trump, no. He says, I'm rich. I'm really rich. I'm so rich, you wouldn't believe how rich I am. I don't even need to be out here doing this. I'm doing it because I want to make America great again. He doesn't even pretend to be humble. Um, and they eat this up. The audience listens to this. So here's your intention to vote for Trump. Um, a Rand American Life panel. Oops. Um, if you're very satisfied with your economic status versus very dissatisfied, notice the more dissatisfied you are, probability of voting for Trump. So a lot of his support is being driven by this economic dissatisfaction, particularly related to stagnant wages and this perception that part of that is being driven down by these trade deals. Right? I mean, you can see the overlap with Bernie Sanders, why they're both attracting a lot of support. Sanders' solutions go in a different direction, of course. Um, I talked about his audience. It's downscale, but I had a research assistant look at all the exit polls and see what his average support was among various demographic groups, in this case gender, and how many times he won that demographic group. That is, he finished with a plurality or a majority support among that group in any particular nominating contest. Now look at this. We think of him as being misogynistic. And it is true that his support among men, he wins on average 41%. This is going to every contest, back to Iowa. So obviously his percentages are going up as the number of candidates are dropping out. But you get the sense here. Women, he does slightly worse. But look at this. In 65%, now this is among the Republican races, 65% of the Republican contests, women vote for him more than any other candidate. He beats all other Republicans among women, 65% of the time. Education, obviously he does slightly better among high school or less education as you go up uh, until he gets to the pointy-headed nerds like you people, uh, and then his work goes down. But even among college graduates, 65% of the time, he wins that demographic, right? Um, college graduates supporting him. Of course, he does even better among high school or lesser college. Only the postgraduate people who can't get a job, that's why they go into graduate school, don't support him, right? Um, don't mean to insult all of you. Income, again, he does slightly better, 43%. On average, there's earning less. But look at middle income people and higher income people. He also does substantially well. And again, he wins 61% of the time among this income group, too. So his support is much broader than Bernie Sanders, whose really his support is clustered around a narrow ideological band within the Democratic Party. Sander, uh, Trump is winning across income, demographic, and even gender. And he's doing that because his message is not a traditional Republican message. Um, it's really a message that's grounded on economic populism. He wants to protect Social Security. None of this Ted Cruz privatizing Social Security. He wants to protect it. Doesn't say how he's going to protect it, but he's going to protect it, right? Um, you know, Planned Parenthood. None of this, let's get rid of Planned Parenthood entirely. He likes that part of Planned Parenthood that supports contraceptives, right? The abortion thing, you can tell his heart's not in the abortion thing. He sort of adopted that stringent abortion position, which is a reversal of his previous one, because he figured he's got to do that in the Republican Party um, primary. So he's not a social conservative, <coughs> which is why the social conservatives aren't voting for him, right? Um, he doesn't do that well among evangelicals. Um, he's really a non-traditional Republican candidate who's done very well in cutting across existing partisan lines. We sometimes talk about candidates in terms of their personal qualities. And so again, we have a questionnaire as political scientists and where we talk to them about um, whether your candidate can be characterized as emphasizing um, liberty, sort of a Rand Paul, loyalty, authority, sanctity, these are the social conservatives. Um, proportionality, so what you get out of the system should be uh, equivalent to what you put in or care and empathy, right? And this right here, the zero, is where the public is on these issues. So what we're showing here is where the candidates are relative, based again on um, responses to survey questions, the, these indexes that political scientists create, where the candidates are relative and to the American voter. 
And again, these are somewhat crude. But here's the interesting thing. Donald Trump supporters are slightly in the middle. I mean, if you want to think about proportionality, Cruz and Rubio have much higher emphasis on you should only get out of the system what you put in. Or loyalty, authority, sanctity. Yeah, Trump supporters are up there a little bit, but not nearly as much as Mike Huckabee. He's about with a little bit below Cruz, a little bit below Ben Carson, right? Um, Liberty, eh, his supporters aren't huge libertarians compared, again, to Rand Paul or to Ted Cruz, right? Who's he closest to? Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush's supporters are really about as mainstream as can be. And then there's Donald Trump's, right? So you have this view of him as his followers are all wearing brown shirts and going around, as one person said when I bought the Make America Great hat, where is your armband? Why didn't you purchase that? Uh, But it turns out they're really not. They're not like that. Um, At least not to the way, so according to the researchers who wrote this piece, one surprise in our data was that Trump supporters were not extreme on any of the foundations. This means that Trump supporters are more centrist than is commonly realized. Consequently, Trump's prospects in the general election, here you can gasp, may be better than many pundits have thought. And I am reluctantly coming to that conclusion. All right, a couple other quick things and then I'll stop. Why is Trump doing so well? The other thing is free media. Media industry, particularly traditional media outlets, are shedding money and readers arm over fist. Arm over fist? Hand over fist. fist. And arm over fist. That's how bad it is for them. Uh, And so when Trump came along, he's generating ratings bonanzas. And he didn't even have to pay for it. So this is average coverage on network TV in minutes. Here's Trump. Here's all the other candidates. I mean, he has gotten so good that he doesn't even have to appear on the Sunday talk shows. They just let him call up on the phone and they interview him. I mean, this is unprecedented. They've become his lapdogs. Uh, you know, I used to have, this is Dana Bash. Um, you go to the Trump rallies and they're doing stand up at the Trump rallies. It's the only rallies we see all the cable people at um, consistently, right? Because it's ratings, right? Um, there's the four media penned up in the back, not allowed to circulate among the real people. This is another Trump rally. And what does that do? Here's your vote share. That's this. Here's your favorability ratings. Uh, this is your share. Well, these are bad. This is your share of your news coverage. I guess that's supposed to be this vote share here. And then this is your favorability. And look at how they, this is for Trump, how they just basically go. It doesn't even matter if his news coverage is necessarily positive. His vote share just goes up. The more media coverage he gets, the more people are exposed, the more support he gets. He doesn't even pay for this. The media just gives him this free coverage. And of course, uh, there's also this backlash to perceived political correctness. On the Middlebury campus, we've had a sombrero incident, uh, which uh, some stupid student, I take that back, one of my students, a very smart student, um, was going to a party wearing a sombrero, and uh, a student of Mexican heritage asked what she was doing wearing a sombrero. And she said, well, I'm going to go get drunk and go to a Mexican theme party. Actually, the student was a little offended about this, one of the Mexican heritage. And this sparked uh, a campus dialogue on cultural appropriation and so on. And, you know, this fits in with the Halloween costume stuff that you've heard about at Yale. And these are sensitive issues and important issues that need to be discussed on campus. Um, There was a recent Bowdoin sombrero controversy, and I just happened to ignore the story and read the comments. And these are the comments I got. Because the reality is while we're, and these are important and sensitive issues that need to be discussed on campus, a segment of the American public thinks colleges have just gone crazy. And the inmates are running the asylum on these issues, discussing some of these issues. And he feeds right into that. And this is what the comments say. This sort of silliness is part of what is behind Donald Trump. And this is why this country needs Donald Trump, whether he gets elected in November or not, whether you agree with him on everything or not, we had better hope he keeps talking and someone else follows behind him who does the same thing and someone else after that. And WAPO, Washington Post, and all the rest can spend their days demonizing them in the press, but at least the message will still be forced into the public square that a very large portion of this country will never ever get on board with this regressive, dogmatic, anti-racism as quasi-religion propaganda. 
in his rallies, he fit. He says, I don't have time. People criticize my language. Melania always says, Donald, why did you have to say that? Our country's problems are too big for political correctness. We don't have time. When I become president, I can be very presidential, he tells you. Then I'll worry about that when I'm president. Right now, we got to win the election. And people nod their head. They say, yeah, he's right. We've gone too far on political correctness. Uh, and the final thing, he has mastered social media. Anyone here on Trump's Twitter feed? Oh, you're missing out. Nobody is better at engaging an audience uh, in 140 characters or less. How many here are on Twitter? You know what I'm talking about with Twitter? It's, you know, the only reason I'm on it is because the college made me get on it to advertise my blog post. So he will say something, and it, it fits him, because basically all his policy views can be encapsulated in 140 characters. And that's basically the level of depth that he gets to. So this is a medium, social media, that is made for him. Uh, and then I just, you know, captured a couple of them here uh, when he found out that ISIS fighters had infiltrated Europe. He tweets out, just announced, oops, sorry, we'll show you that one in a moment. Just announced that as many as 5,000 ISIS fighters have infiltrated Europe. Also, many in U.S. I told you so. I alone can fix this problem. 11,409 people like it. It got retweeted 4,500 times. That's par for the course for a Trump thing. Look at this one. Now, this is when he gets in trouble. This is a retweet. He didn't actually do this. This is when a super PAC on Cruz's behalf published a picture of his wife, Melania, who had posed for GQ magazine, and fairly provocative. Uh, and Trump got really mad. And uh, someone posted this, and he retweeted it um, with a picture is worth a 1,000 words. And of course, this is juvenile. I mean, this guy's running for president. This is juvenile. Can you believe this? And of course, uh, it got liked by 17,209 people. Juvenile or not, people are sending this around. Now, liking it doesn't mean they're voting for Trump, but it does mean he is dominating discourse. Whether it's on social media or traditional media, it's Donald Trump all the time. Right? He's a master at this. Um, all right, so why is the Donald winning? Correct blend of issues, economic populism and American first I would say American security first foreign policy, maximum exposure through free media, strategic use of social media. As a non-politician who does not appear politically correct, he appeals to Republicans dissatisfied with status quo politics. And finally, as I know all too well, he took advantage of the fact that there were 16 other Republican candidates out there. And the party simply did not coalesce behind anyone quick enough to serve as a focal point, as an alternative. And he just picked them off one by one. Anyone who dared, beginning with Rand Paul, all the way up through Jeb, low energy Jess, Jeb, all the way up through Lion Ted, they all serially attacked him. And he just picked them off one by one uh, until it was too late, right? Now you got poor Mitt Romney saying, John Kasich, why don't you run in the Northeast? Ted Cruz, you run in the West and the South and we'll block Donald Trump from winning the nomination. Well, Ted Cruz is saying, that's a great strategy, but let me run as the alternative. And John Kasich saying, that's a great strategy, but let me run as the alternative. They, even with two candidates, they can't coordinate. And they have a, a person there, Mitt Romney, trying to do this, right? All right, so everybody talks about Donald Trump's high unfavorability ratings. He'll never get elected. There's only been, since 1984, one other candidate who is viewed as unfavorably as him. And wouldn't you have it? It's Hillary Clinton. So I'm not even sure that's going to hurt him in the general election, right? Um, all right. I won't, never mind this, never mind that, never mind that. So let me finish with this. What does Trump mean? Is this just Trump, or are we undergoing a more significant restructuring of the American political landscape? This is what I'm grappling with. And I'm going to leave you with some thoughts on this, and we can talk about it. Um, one reason that we've seen such polarization, not among the public, but among our elites, is that conflict in American politics has increasingly operated along a single dimension. There are no more conservative Democrats. There are no more liberal Republicans like there used to be. And so as ideology has mapped onto party, party has become increasingly useful predictor of where you stand on a range of issues. And that has created a perception of growing polarization. 
um, and it's left little space for cross-partisan cooperation. You don't ever want to work with the other party because the other party is uniformly on the wrong side of the issues. It makes it very hard to get things done. And in particular, you don't want to stray from the party when races are so competitive. So this is, we saw the period in which Republicans dominated, New Deal period in which Democrats dominated. This is the, the relative share of one party versus the other party. And now look at, since the 1990s, we have had pretty much party balance within the realm of divided government. It's become the norm. And so it makes it increasingly important to hang together as a party and to any issues that are threatening your party hegemony, you've got to keep them off the agenda. That's created a logjam. And that logjam, we have begun to see fissures in that, as there are a growing number of voters who don't view themselves as aligning with either of these two parties and are focusing on issues that neither of these two parties are focusing on. And that's what we call a, a potential for realignment, a large-scale shift in partisanship causing a new partisan balance and often but not always leading to a new majority and a new minority party, typically occurs over several elections, although results often seem to occur in a single election, often instigated by the rise of new issues, signified the emergence of third party movements. Do we have a new issue? These are previous realignments. Income inequality, trade, you know, it's possible. It's possible something's going on here that we are due for, an, if you believe realignment theory, and not everybody does, we should have had one, and we possibly did have one in the 1960s, the end of the New Deal era, perhaps on civil rights. Maybe in 1990, Obama was supposed to herald the next era of the realignment. That clearly hasn't come to pass. It's possible that this is just a phase. It's a Trump phase, and it means nothing. Or it's possible that Trump is at the head in the most visible part of an underlying restructuring of the Republican Party in ways that reverberate down the road. Now, of course, a lot of this depends on whether the guy wins come November. Um, but it's clear that Trump and Sanders threatened to disrupt the existing partisan alignment. They've used emerging issues of international trade, immigration, American security first, and income inequality to divide parties between a less educated, lower income, younger voter who feels left behind by the current political and economic system against the better, better educated, higher income voter who benefits to a greater degree from the status quo. And I'm not even going to show you this. The point is, there is evidence that there is a second dimension that's reconfiguring American politics, different from the traditional conservative liberal dimension on traditional issues. And this one is, in some ways, joining the extremities of both parties who are voting together against the center. And that's what this slide basically shows you. These are scores on underlying dimension. This is on the conservative wing. This is the liberal wing. These are blue Democratic legislators. The red are Republican legislators. And this is the second dimension which we think is anti-authoritarianism or anti-establishment. And what you see, basically, is the movement from 2005 to now, the most conservative Republicans and the most liberal Democrats are on the same position on this second dimension, whereas in previous years, they were entirely different. Conservatives were, whatever this dimension is, were up here, the most liberal were down here. But you can see what's shifting here is, is the Republican Party in Congress. Think about the House Freedom Caucus. So we are seeing a realignment of the Republican Party. And it raises the question, are we envisioning President Trump? Is he the future of American politics? And it might not be all bad if he can make America great again. <laughs> Let me stop there. Welcome your questions. Sorry, I went a little long here, but I'm squandering my leave, so at least I can do is go an extra 10 minutes. Questions? Yes. I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. If we did have President Trump, how would he fit into Newstat's version of the governance system where the president's 
only and biggest power is the power of persuasion, given that Mr. Trump has never run for public office, has never held a job where he really has to listen to other people and not make decisions unilaterally? Great question. So, you know, obviously, anybody who raises the question involving Newstead automatically gets an A for the course. So let's <laughs> give her an A since he was my PhD advisor. Um, and I know that question was a plant, but that's fine. Okay. I am asked this by reporters all the time. And my initial response was, because when you listen to him at his rallies, that's the one thing he never addresses. Everything is me, 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 me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to build a huge wall. It's going to be so huge, they're going to call it the Trump Wall. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to have a big door in the middle to allow legal immigrants to come back in. I don't know if that's a metaphorical door or a literal big door in the middle. I, I, but he never talks about how things get done. And he finally got asked once about this. And he said, listen, at a rally, this was asked almost a question like this. He said, wouldn't it be great if we got people who knew how to get deals done? He said, I grew up giving contributions to Democrats and Republicans. I didn't care because I just wanted to get the deal done. He said, that's how I'm going to be as president. And I thought about this and I said, genius. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what you need. Somebody who is not wedded to party orthodoxy all, wants to do is get, for his own sake, I want a wall built. I could just see this guy saying, man, I want this wall so desperately. I don't care what I need to do to bring these two parties together. So that is my optimistic view, that he actually understands the need, to borrow a phrase, uh, to construct the art of the deal. And that's the argument he makes. Of course, that deal making is in the context of nonpartisan profit making machines, which is entirely different than governing. Um, so. You know, in my dark, pessimistic days, I think this guy is going to be a disaster. Um, he has no idea how government works, how the executive branch works, the role of Congress. I can't tell you which one of those scenarios. Um, you know, I've been wrong on this guy so often that I don't trust myself to say anything <laughs> that makes sense. But I'm cautiously optimistic that in some ways he is free of the baggage that previous candidates, I mean, both George W. Bush and Barack Obama promised to be uniters, not dividers. They have turned out to be the most partisan, polarizing presidents we have had since we have constructing measures of this. And it reflects, in part, this underlying tension between the parties who are uniformly homogenous ideologically and opposed to each other. I think he has the potential to break that logjam. I mean, if this guy is elected, hated by both sides, um, Jeez, more power too. But I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, so when John Oliver did his uh, Donald Trump thing, I didn't see. People started really talking about it. But he only, he's only on once a week. He doesn't do politics all the time. Um, Sarah B. Her show hasn't really caught fire. Trevor Noah, the South African dude commenting on American politics. He's the one who replaced Stewart, was it? Yeah. yeah. It's just not really connecting. Like he he doesn't really have any. Any footing. So, do you think, like, if someone like John Stewart was still around, like, eviscerating Trump on a daily basis, <laughs> oh. this might not have happened? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because I think, uh, I think a lot of people were making fun. Of. I mean, there is this blogger at Middlebury College who wrote this entire satirical. Now, his audience was like a thousand people. Uh, wrote this entire satirical piece eviscerating him. You have to go to his rallies when he gets attacked by the liberal elite media. Man, his ratings just go up. I mean, his support goes up. The best thing that would happen for him is John Stewart to come back and start eviscerating him. And you'd get those college students hanging up at night watching John Stewart. And meanwhile, the, uh, the Trump supporters would say, see, he is hated by the establishment. Nobody likes this guy. Uh, he's bulletproof. I've learned this. He, he can say anything. Teflon Don. Teflon Don. I mean, you don't have to agree with the statement that he could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot people and his support would go up. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to see him try. Uh, but that is part of his appeal, that he thumbs his nose at the people who are the trendsetters in society. He just thumbs his nose at them. And you go to his rallies and they just love it. I ask people about this. At the Plattsburgh rally, this is a quintessential... Um, 
and my wife can vouch for this. Um, there, I, so what I do is at these rides, I go around and talk to people and ask them, why are you supporting Trump? Three middle-aged women, and I hope I'm not insulting them. Um, they look middle-aged to me. They were, what, 35? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and I said, you know, are you Trump supporters? They said, yes. Uh, and I said, what about his comments about women? He just says that to attract media attention. I mean, uh, so, so I said, so what, what is it about him? And he said, he is uh, talking about issues that no one else will talk about, that the parties are scared to talk about. He's not afraid to address these issues, like immigration and so on. I said, well, this is very refreshing. Can I take your picture? They said, no. Are you kidding me? I would get harassed back on campus if anybody knew that I was a Trump supporter. It's that type of thing he's tapping into. Um, there are people who, more than you think, sitting in this room, who secretly are going to pull the lever for Donald Trump. But they're not going to tell you that. They're not going to tell you that. Uh, because he has, it is not phony. It is not, he's not just appealing to the bigots and the racists, although I'm sure he's appealing to them too. Uh, but he has tapped into a much broader level of support. Now, so far, this it is all entire campaign has taken place within the context of the Republican Party. Once he's out there, head to head with Hillary, uh, he, he, it'll be interesting to see whether he just melts. Because he's going to get a lot more criticism, a lot more pointed targeting attacks from the Democratic machine. Um, but I made the mistake of underestimating him once. I am not going to do that again. I am not one of these people who think he's destroying the Republican Party and he's just a sacrificial lamb. I think the guy's got a legitimate shot at winning the general election. If I had to put odds on it, I'd say Hillary's going to win right now. But that's coming from the guy who said he'd be out of the race in three weeks. So what does that mean? Probably not. I wouldn't bet the family farm on it. So I just don't think, as much as I love John Stewart, I don't think Stewart could crack this guy. His support is just too deep. And in some ways, Stewart would just f fan the flames. Of Trump support. We are yeah. out of time. Thank you, man. Thank you. If you have more questions to ask, please yeah, ask. Please stick around.